joining us. I'm Pastor Rodney, the lead pastor here at Fountain of Life Church. Isn't it great to come together and, and to sing praises to God? And we want to thank you for joining us. And we want to let you know if you are here today, and today may be your first time here at Fountain of Life, we want to encourage you. You should have received a worship guide. Inside that worship guide, there's a little connect card you can fill out. It's perforated. You can pull it apart. We want to encourage you to fill that out. And and at the end of the service, if you will just go to our Welcome Center in the foyer, we have a gift of your choosing. We just want to just bless you and thank you for coming. Please fill that card out. We pray for it throughout the week. You may be going through something, and we would love to pray for you and with you over that. So thank you for coming. We also want to let you know, um, first of the year, we're starting Life Steps. It's our new process of allowing us to get to know you if you're new, and you get to know us as well. And so we want to encourage you to, to maybe fill out um, our text. We don't have our image yet, but we will. But it's Life Steps. We started the first of the year. We want to thank you. We're going to continue to sing now and give praises to God. We want you to join us today as we worship him. God bless you. Lift up the gates, fling wide the doors, the King of Glory's coming. Through city streets and living hearts, we see His spirits moving. Cause now His kingdom comes, now His will be done. Lift up your banners and practice your praise. Fill up your mouths with that glorious name. To the lost, tell them our God is with us. Come prophesy that now's the time. Get ready, church. Let's rise up. Cause now is kingdom comes. Now is will be done. Lift up your banners and practice your praise. Fill up your mouths with that glory. Emmanuel, you believe that today? Come on again, praise. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We glorify you. 
fill our mouths with your praise, oh God. Hallelujah. Come on, let's declare this today. church all over this um, room can you begin to just lift your hands begin to tell him how good he is that there is no one like him no one that compares to him Lord we bless you we worship you today
like you. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth, Father. The word tells us that you put the stars in place. We have come to worship you, to exalt your name today. We come to recognize who you are. You are faithful. Even in the times of our life, the word says you are faithful when we are not faithful because you are sovereign. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for that. At this time, we want to ask our prayer team to come forward. And as the prayer team is coming forward, as the worship team continues to sing, as we sing praises to God, you may be going through something. You may be having a hard time. You may be needing a healing. You may need a restoration in your life. You may be having a financial difficulty in your life. Can I tell you, these folks right up here, they want to lock elbows with you. They want to pray with you. We want to see God work a miracle in your life because we serve a God who is able to provide everything we possibly can need to live life to the fullest. And so as the worship team continues to sing, we want to encourage you to continue to sing as well. But if you need prayer, please let us pray with you. We want to lift you up to our Heavenly Father. Join us.
name, this Jesus. Sing that again. And oh, oh, this Jesus, this Jesus. Come on, call on the name of Jesus. Sing that again. And oh, oh, oh but this Jesus, oh, but this Jesus. One more time, worship him all over this place. Oh, oh, this Jesus, this Jesus. Oh, come, let us adore Thee. Church, can we do that this morning? Can we just worship Him in this place? Lord, we adore you, God. We adore you in this place for you're worthy. You're worthy, God. We worship your mighty name. Come on, just begin to praise Him in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, we give you glory. God, we give you honor, God. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, can we just say that name this morning, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, we give you honor, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus is here this morning. We just worship your name, sweet Jesus. Oh, sweet Jesus. Just worship your mighty name. You're so worthy, God. Jesus, Jesus. Lord, we just give you glory, God. We praise you in this place. We magnify your name because your name is holy, God. And we're thankful that we can come into this place and praise your name. We give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can head back to your seats this morning. How are you excited this morning to be in the house of God? Amen. All right, I appreciate both of you. 
just kidding. We're going to get to talk about joy this morning. I'm excited about that. Two of them again. <laughs> if you know me, you know I'm the Christmas guy. Man, I love Christmas. I love, I've got a hundred and something manger scenes in my house. I'd love for you to come check out if you ain't seen that. It's awesome. But I love that. I love Christmas. I can start getting, man, I, I start getting that feeling in August, you know. It's Christmas time, which I know it's not. But for me, it is. I love Christmas. It just gives me this, man, it just, I just burst in with joy. But throughout the whole year, but sometimes it's not easy during Christmas. We've already had four, four Christmas parties that I've been to so far. How many of you had at least one Christmas party so far? How about two? Three? Four? Golly, five? No, okay. Four's a lot. Look, I was figuring the other day, I've had four Christmas parties, I've got eight left, so that's 12 Christmas parties. And I got to thinking, man, that's a lot. <laughs> and if you're not, if that just not your thing, then I can see where you'd lose some of that joy inside of you because it's hard. There's a lot of running around. There's a lot of things that have to be done. And, man, your, your kids want this certain thing, and none of the stores have it. Ah! And so you order it, but it's not going to get in until after Christmas, so you have to figure something else out. There's things that just zap your joy and take your joy away. We're going to talk about that this morning because there's, there's times. Maybe you lost someone. Maybe there's an empty seat at the table. And so it's hard to find that place of joy. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. We're going to talk about Mary. We talked about her a little bit last week as well, but it was about peace. And today we're going to speak about joy. Verse 26, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with a child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she was said to be barren and is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Now think about Mary in this moment. The first thing that comes to mind is not joy. I think of some other words, but joy is probably not the one that, that comes to mind. I think there might be a little bit of doubt, possibly a little bit of fear. Think about this. She's 12 years old, 13, 14, somewhere in that area. Hey, Sky, stand up for me. How old are you, Sky, 12? That's a 12-year-old girl. You can be seated. <laughs> Y'all give it up for Sky. 12-year-old girl. Think about it for just a moment. She's got to go back to her mom and say, Hey, Mom, I'm pregnant, but I'm still a virgin. So I imagine some of the thoughts that's going through her head. Hey, my mom's fixing to kill me, right? And my dad's fixing to kill Joseph. So there's a lot of thoughts. There's a lot of things going through her head. Man, what do I do with this? So joy probably wasn't it. There was some fear. There was some doubt, some fear of the future, fear of what was going to go on. Difficult times, difficult situations. But how did she respond? She said, let it be so. May everything you said about me come true. Now, at this point, she wasn't overwhelmed with joy, but she was willing to say, hey, God, I don't get it. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. And it's even humanly impossible. But if it's your will for my life, 
then that's what I want. She was willing to accept. She was willing to say that. How many times do we miss God's will for our life just simply because we don't understand it? We don't get it. It doesn't make any sense in our own strengths. There's no way I can do that, God. That's impossible. And a lot of times we miss what he has for us. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could get to the point where we say, God, I don't understand what you're doing here. It makes no sense to me. It's past my realm of understanding, God. But if that's what you want to do, let it be so. Let it be so, God. I don't get it. It makes no sense. But let it be so. See, I think that's the very first thing. How do you get a, to a place of overwhelming joy? How did Mary get to a place where she was at that, that moment of overwhelming joy? The first thing she had to do was accept God's plan for her life. Now, in accepting God's plan, you're accepting whatever comes along with that. Just because it's God's plan doesn't mean that it's easy. I think we miss that sometimes. It's God's plan. Woo, it's going to be straight and easy. we got to make this path. We go straight, and bam, there we are. Nope. Think about this. You're pregnant, okay? Ladies, y'all think about this for just a second. This, we're going to talk about Mary for a minute. Mary was pregnant. She's young. Why do y'all think she went to Elizabeth's house? Her aunt's. Probably, I don't know this, but I, what I'm thinking is this. Mama's going to have to do some damage control. Mama's going to have to explain to the neighbors. Mama's going to have to bring the family in and explain what's going on. She said, hey, just, just go. I know you're 12, you're 13 years old, but go get on a donkey, travel four days to get to your aunt's house that you haven't seen in a while. Think about that. So she's got all these things going on in her head, all this different stuff going on in her mind. So joy is not what I think she would have. It wasn't easy. I imagine, ladies, I, I've seen a lot of you get married. I've seen my own wife get married, and she has these plans, and she had these plans way, way before we got married. You know, and the plans was, hey, I, I want this perfect ring, and I want this perfect dress, and I want you to look the best that you can, <laughs> right? And I want a certain amount of of bridesmaids, a certain amount of groomsmen, and I want it to be perfect. And at this moment, man, doves are going to fly out of your hat or whatever, and then this white stuff's going to be thrown in the air. It's going to be beautiful. I'm sure Mary had a plan. She had this plan that she wanted. To, this is what's going to happen, and it's so awesome. But here's the thing. God changed plans because her plan was different than God's. How many times in our life does God change our plans? She had a perfect dream. I imagine she, you know, her husband was a carpenter. So she's like, man, in a couple years after we get married, we're going to, man, he's going to build me a house. It's going to be my dream house. It's going to be this awesome nursery with a drop down television for the baby. Okay, maybe not that. But it's going to be awesome, man. And as soon as I have my baby, I can take him and put him in the nursery. Oh, it's going to be awesome. God changed all that. And it wasn't glamorous, and it wasn't pretty. And it for sure wasn't easy, but God changed it. I remember when God called me. God called me into ministry when I was 16 years old. And I just assumed, notice that I assumed, God didn't tell me, I assumed that he wanted me to go into music ministry. Hey, God, you gave me a talent in this area, so I'm assuming that's what you want me to do. And so I pursued that for a long time until God finally said, hey, that's not what I want you to do. Hello. Not that I didn't enjoy that and I loved it. But I wasn't fulfilled because it wasn't the ministry God had placed me in. It wasn't the plan God had for me. But I just assumed this must be the plan that God wants. This must be the plan that God has. Turn with me, if you would, to Job. And I know this isn't a Christmas story. But, man, Job is awesome. If you're ever down, read Job. I promise you it's not as bad as Job. Job chapter 1, verse 13 through 22 says this. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came in and said, The fire of God fell from the sky 
and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, I was telling him earlier, we probably should have locked the door at that point. After the third person come in, I'm going to lock the door. Nobody else can tell me no bad news. While he was speaking, another messenger came in and said the Chaldeans formed three raid parties, swept down on their camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who's escaped. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came in. Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert, struck the four corners of the house, and collapsed on them, and they're dead. I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. Listen to this, though. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground in worship, and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Do you think that was Job's plan when he got up that morning? To lose everything he had? I'm sure that wasn't his plan. There was a, there was a detour. There was a difference in his plan that day. Now, was that God's plan? No, but God allowed it. And here's the thing. Sometimes God will allow things to happen in your life because he sees what's greater in the future. And a lot of times we miss that because we're like, no, God, this is hard. This is tough. This is difficult. I can't believe you're allowing this. And God's saying, I'm allowing it because this is a whole lot easier than what you would have faced. And you just can't imagine what it's going to look like on the other side. Job was willing to say, God, I don't understand this. It makes no sense that I lost all of my kids. It makes no sense that I have no money anymore. This makes no sense to me, God. It's not even a humanly possible thing for this all to go with this bad in one day. But I do believe this, and I know this. As long as I trust you, everything's going to be okay. You see, he had a joy that I can't even fathom. I can't understand that. Think about it. At your worst times, at your deepest and lowest levels, to say, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to get on my knees, and I'm going to worship you, even though right now is not a good time. Getting to a point where we accept God's plan. Difficult. I remember uh, a few weeks ago, I was at, at Miss Marlene's house, and I was raking some yard, uh, raking the leaves and cutting some grass and stuff like this. And, and there was a big pile of leaves. There was a lot of leaves. I mean, a lot of leaves. <laughs> It's like six to eight inches of leaves, and I'm blowing this for 40 minutes. I'm blowing in this one little area. I'm trying to get them to a certain spot where I can get the lawnmower over there and kind of mulch them up and cut it and all this kind of stuff. And so I'm blowing these leaves, and, man, I'm just having a good time. I got the backpack blower going. I'm blowing the leaves, and I'm just kind of praying just to myself because I mean, there ain't nobody around, and I'm just chilling over there, right? So I'm blowing these leaves. All of a sudden, my ankles are on fire, man. I mean, they're on fire. I'm like, Lord, what the deal? I look down, and there's fire ants that's got in my shoe, and they're tearing me up. How many of you ever been bit by a fire ant? It's pleasant, ain't it? No. So they are tearing me up. I mean, just eating me alive. I'm like, ah! <laughs> so I take my shoe off. I throw the backpack, leave it on, just throw the thing around and let it run. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm knocking it down, trying to get all these ants off my feet. And I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I'm aggravated about these ants. Why are these ants biting me? I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense. And I'm all frustrated, thinking to myself, I need to go get some gas. I'm going to set these things on fire. That's what I wanted to do. But I just stopped for just a second, and I just sat there. I'm like, man, this hurts. <laughs> and I looked down, and right in front of me, I mean this far, a foot in front of me, was a snake with his head up like this. Now, I thought it was a copperhead. It probably wasn't a copperhead. But either way, it doesn't matter. God showed me something in that moment. He said, sometimes you got to get bit by the ants where you don't get tore up by the serpent. And when he told me that, I said, man, what does that mean, God? And he said this. He said, look, sometimes you're going to go through a difficult time. Sometimes there's situations that you're going to face. But, man, if you wouldn't have faced them and you would have went a different way, the serpent was at the door with his mouth wide open, and he was going to chomp on you. Sometimes you got to go through difficult times. Sometimes you got to go through a little bit of pain to get where you need to go. But if you continue to follow on God and understand and accept His will for your life, understand at the end is so much better. Accepting God's will, accepting His plan. 
Second thing I believe she did was believe God's plan. Turn back with me to Luke 1. We're going to continue reading 39 through 45. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. See, I think Mary, when she first heard the news, she didn't believe 100%. I think there was a little bit of doubt there. But she said, God, if it's your will, let it be so. Let it be so. If that's what you want, I'll accept what you're saying. I'm not 100% believing it right now, but I'll accept it. And she had an angel talking to her. How many of you had an angel talk to you this week? Other than me. All right. That was good, wasn't it? <laughs> ah, your wife. That's a good move there. All right. <laughs> Think about that. An angel spoke straight to her. But there was still a moment of doubt in her mind. She needed a physical moment where somebody spoke life into her. She said that Elizabeth said the same exact thing that the angel of God said to her. But when but when Elizabeth said it, she believed it. Now what does that what does that say? A lot of times somebody will speak something into your life and say exactly what God's been telling you for months. And, and all of a sudden you're like, Oh yes, God's gonna do something. And God's like, I've been trying to do something, you're not listening. We need that physical moment of somebody speaking life into us. And I think that's what happened here. For just a second, Elizabeth stopped. Because listen to what she says after this. Mary says, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Now she's saying, instead of God, let it be so. Now she's saying, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. She was blessed before. But she needed that moment. And here, that's why it's so important. When God tells you to speak something into somebody's life and you miss that opportunity, it is so important because sometimes people are waiting to hear. Just like Gideon. I spoke to him, what, 26 times? Maybe not that many. <laughs> Two or three times over and over again. He kept putting out this fleece over and over and over again. Here's the thing. Sometimes people need you to confirm something that God's already spoke to them. It's just like when you get saved. How many can remember when you got saved and you feel that inside of you? You feel stuff changing. Man, life is different. It's, it's causing you to, to be different and act different and want to do things different and sometimes even look different. But it's so much more encouraging when you're walking along life and somebody comes in beside you and says man I really see a difference in you I see that God's really doing something you already had confirmation that God was doing something because you knew you were changing but man when somebody else tells you boy that takes it to a new place and takes it to a new level so she accepted God's plan the second thing she did was believe his plan third thing you got to do is a little bit harder Third thing you got to do is walk in God's plan. That one's tough. Look back at verse 28 and 29. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. I want you to think about that for just a second. You are highly favored. Greetings. You're blessed by God. How many of you get greeted that way every day? Let me tell you what the youth say. <laughs> How about that? Hey, stupid. Hey, Pastor Baldy. Hey, Pastor Old Guy. I love y'all. I've been waiting on y'all to say, hey, you that's highly favored. <laughs> Man, y'all going to be my favorite teenager if one of y'all starts saying that to me. I'm just saying. But if they would say that, 
what would I think? What would be the first thing that come to mind if one of them said that? What do you want? What, what do you want? No, seriously, tell me what you want because there's something wrong. I really think that's where Mary was at. Because why would she be troubled by that? What a greeting. Man, that's a great greeting, but she was troubled by it. Why would she be troubled by it? Because probably what, here, here's what Mary was probably thinking. She's like, hmm, if that's really God, what? Man, he must really want me to do something. Why would he send somebody to say that to me unless he was wanting something, unless he was expecting me to do something? Think about that. So she was troubled. She was worried. See, a lot of us want to, to watch a miracle, but we don't want to be a part of the miracle. We kind of want to sit back, watch it, but not be a part of it. I really believe that some of you are you want to be in the presence of God and you want to get down here when there's a fire and God's moving and man and, and you get close but you kind of just warming your hands up by the fire because you don't want to get in there too close because if you get too close and you get too close to the presence of God then all of a sudden he's going to begin to ask you to do things that you don't want to do like Pastor Ronnie told me he said when he was younger he was afraid to get too close because he was afraid God was going to send him to Africa guess where he's going next year just for a moment, though, not forever. But now he wants to. But that's what we do. We, we think, man, if we get too close to God, if we get too close to the presence of God and we just go ahead and turn everything over him and we begin to walk out what he has for us and we get too close to him, then he's going to want me to do something that I'm not ready to do. He's going to want me to get up and speak in front of people. Look, I hated speaking in front of people when I was a kid. I hated it. I don't love it now. I'm just playing. We get so caught up in what he wants us, what we think he's going to want us to do. Or we even say this. We're like, oh, my gosh. If I get too close to God, he's going to expect me to be in church every week. If I get too close to God, he, he's going to expect me to lead a small group. If I get too close to God, he, man, he may want me to work with teenagers, and I don't even like them. If I get too close to God, he's going to want me to work in the nursery. Heaven forbid. And we spend all of our life just right on the outside of what God's will is for our life because we're afraid to step into it because we're afraid that he's going to either put us to work or we're going to get to the point in our life where we're going to have to change some things and he's not going to want you to watch that anymore. He's not going to want you to do that anymore. He's not going to want you to go to that place anymore or act that way anymore and he's going to want you to change some stuff and you know that change is going to hurt you and so you sit right on the outside of the anointing that he has for you because we're afraid I think God's really saying this morning quit being the wet log that never is able to be lit and begin to be the catalyst for the fire that he wants to start Some of you are upset because of the atmosphere of your job. You don't like where your job is at. You don't like the way people act and are around you. You don't like the way they treat you at your job. Can I tell you, if you'll learn to accept God's will and believe that He's got a perfect will for you and then begin to walk in that, that you can be the catalyst to change what's going on at your job. You can be the one that changes the whole atmosphere of your workplace. Students, I've heard some of y'all say, man, one day God's going to set that school on fire. Why can't today be that one day? Why can't you be that somebody? We always like to say, somebody's going to move, man. Somebody's going to be, man. Somebody's going to stir up revival. Why can't you be somebody? God's saying, I, wanna, I want you to be the one but you won't walk out what I've called you to do.
you want something to change, you want things around you to be different, then begin to let joy bubble up inside of you no matter what, the, what you face or what the situation is. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to face difficult times. They're coming your way. If you're not facing them now, you better get ready because you're going to face bad times. Somebody's going to get sick. Somebody's going to die. I'm not trying to be doomsday here. I'm just telling you the truth. You're going to face a financial struggle that you don't understand. But it's how you handle that moment. It's not the moment. It's how you handle it. Because if you handle it right and you still have that joy living inside of you, then the people around you will begin to take notice. And when they go through the same situation or something similar, they're going to begin to ask, how in the world did you have that kind of joy in that moment? It didn't make any sense. And they're going to come to you. What is it that you've got that's different? Because I'm struggling to get out of bed because the depression is just pushing me down. I can't even get up anymore because of the situations I'm facing. And they're not half as bad as what you face. How do you get up every day? And you can say, it's because I got joy exceeding inside of me because I accepted what God had for me. I believed it. And I'm walking it out every day. There's some people in this church that changed my life, and they don't even know it. Years ago, they were trying to have a, a kid. They were getting older, and they man, they wanted to, to have a baby. And they just couldn't have a baby. And one day, one day they got pregnant. It's exciting, exciting day. But I remember halfway through that pregnancy, they lost that baby. And I remember, because it's a close friend of mine, and I remember just it devastating me. I mean, it shook me to my core. And I remember being at home with, with Annie and us just praying and me just, just crying. Because I, I even asked her, I said, what do we say when we see him Sunday? What, how, how do I respond to that? How can we help somebody that's hurting that bad? Because I, I can't imagine that. I don't, some of you have dealt with it. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't imagine. I, I don't understand it. And I remember walking into church that Sunday and seeing that person coming down the hallway with this smile on their face. And I could just see the joy around them. And I remember wrapping my arms around them. And, and they weren't crying, but I was. <laughs> and I just cried. And I began to speak to that person trying to figure out the words to say. And they looked at me and said, hey, it's okay. I don't understand my situation right now. This is one of the hardest moments of my life, and I don't get it, and it doesn't make any sense, but I know one thing. I know that I know that I know as long as I follow the plan that God has for me, that God will move and God will change my circumstances. And it did. I have babies now. But in that moment, that shook me because I didn't understand that kind of joy. I'm not telling you when you go and someone close to you has died and you go in the funeral home that you're going to be happy because that's silly. But I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about something inside of you that ain't an emotion, but it's a lifestyle. When that begins to bubble up inside of you and you're able to make it every day, even though you're at the financial worst place you've ever been financially in your life, or you're at a place where you've lost your mom or your dad and it doesn't make any sense, or your husband passed away, or you just got diagnosed with something, with cancer, or whatever it may be, and it doesn't make any sense in your eyes, but God sees an end. God sees what's on the other side. And he says, if you just stick to my will, if you walk out what I have for you, I promise you, I got you. I got your back. And if I don't know anything else, I know one thing. If Jesus has got your back, it don't matter what you face. Let me get you to bow your heads this morning. Maybe... Maybe you haven't accepted 
the fact that God's will is better than yours. You haven't accepted that. You haven't made that decision to accept that. Or maybe you're having trouble believing. It's just like this when you get saved, man. It's easy sometimes to accept Christ. And it's easy to believe in Him. But, man, it's hard to walk out every day.